downloaded the Buckeye Leafcast with your host, Andrew T. Evans, with special guest, Chris Stefani. That's the way we roll, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, the young, the old, the restless, and those who are ready for the first week of college football. It is here. It is upon us. And, of course, we've got the intergalactic Buckeye fan himself, Mr. Chris Stefanik, along for the ride on another edition of the 2017 version of the Buckeye Leafcast. Here we go. Chris, <laughs> are you psyched? Are you ready? Are, are, are we pumped or what, baby? Dude, four days, man. I cannot wait. It's four days, long. Chris. That's because Ohio State in a very non-traditional way, kicks off this year's season on Thursday night. And even more untraditional, Chris, is the fact that they're doing it against a Big Ten opponent. So they're opening up their season against Indiana on the road. Chris, this is something that they haven't done since ni- like 1976. This is crazy. It's kind of cool. I mean, I like that they're opening up on a Thursday. I like Thursday games. As long as you don't, you didn't play the week prior, because then you have a really short week getting ready for that Thursday game, right? But if you didn't, if you're coming off a bye or coming off of the off season, then a Thursday game is great, because then the next week you have a nice long break mm-hmm. heading into your, you know, I mean, this gives what an extra two days to get ready for Oklahoma, so it's yeah. like, you know, they had plenty of time to get ready for Indiana, and then they'll have nine days to get ready for Oklahoma, so it's it's kind of like a a mini bye week. I've actually had some people say that that they don't like this. They don't like the fact that Ohio State is opening up their season with Indiana on the road and doing it on a Thursday night. What do you feel? I mean, I know you just said, hey, this is actually cool because it gives you a bye week, but what do you think about them opening up with Indiana? I mean, are you for this? Are you like, hey, why not? Let's do something a little outside of the box, or are you a little more of a traditionalist where, hey, I want to open up the season, play non-conference, then when you're done with that, you hop into your league, and then that's that. Well, I, there's two ways to look at it. So just from a jazzed about Ohio State football point of view – it's kind of cool that they're going to be playing big boy football. You know, that it's, it's not going to be against, you know, Army like we're going to see a few weeks from now. Somebody <laughs> that they're just going to roll, right? Because, I mean, Indiana's good. I mean, they're, they're a decent middle of the road Big Ten team, which is, uh, you know, better than some of the cupcakes we usually see about this time of year. And on the other side, from a, you know, what's, what's the best way to stack the cards in Ohio State's favor point of view? Because Ohio State has superior talent, you know, and that's really not even a question mark, then the advantage goes to them if you delay the game and give them a chance to to get the uh you know, their their feet underneath them, to work out any kinks as they're, you know, working in a new offensive coordinator, they got some new starters, getting them a little seasoning. It's it's kinda like you look at that game waiting at the end of the season with Michigan and everybody's like, oh, Michigan lost all these players, so that should be easy for Ohio State to roll them. Last year when they had all had all those players they beat them, you know, barely, but they beat them, you know, and this year that, you know, it's going to be all green guys. So it should be easy this time. Right. It's like, well, are they really going to be green come the 12th game of the season? Probably at that point, you know, they're pretty seasoned. So, you know, it's kind of nice to put some, some cupcakes up front just to get your guys seasoned a little bit. And, um, and then the odds of like of Indiana pulling an upset are a lot worse after Ohio State's had a couple games to get their feet underneath them, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Indiana, I mean, uh, you know, they they went 6-7 and last year. I mean, they've made a bowl now two years in a row. Um, 6-7 and in probably like the toughest division in all of college football. In in all of college football, yeah. I mean, I think they – what they end up doing in the Big Ten, they went – I think they went um, uh, four and five – you know, they went four and five in the Big Ten, and uh, they actually went three and three uh, in the Big Ten East. So, yeah, you know, this is an Indiana team that um, and has traditionally played us tough in Bloomington, too. If you look at the last couple of years, uh, going over and playing Indiana in their house has not been an easy uh, game to win. So is it going to be uh, a cakewalk? 
Uh, or do you think uh, what Indiana's got coming back, which it looks like uh, they've got a, a good contingent of last year's team coming back, or is Ohio State just too loaded, too talented, and going to roll regardless of playing on the road or not? I mean, the short answer is I think Ohio State's too talented and that they're just going to roll them, I think. And it's also Bloomington. It's not like traveling to Happy Valley or anything. It's kind of like – Ohio Stadium West, and that the, the Ohio State fans kind of take <laughs> yeah. over that stadium. Yeah, you know, you'll, yeah. you'll get the OHIO going around mm-hmm. Bloomington. I mean, watch for that Thursday night. It's pr- pretty much guaranteed to happen. Yeah. But, but you know, Iowa does, or Iowa, uh, <laughs> Indiana rather, does return a lot of ex- experienced players, you know, on, on mm-hmm. defense. They got nine yep. starters back, including a, a, a really good one in the middle there, and um, their uh, linebacker. To gray scales, you know, is one of the best in the Ooh. Big Ten. Um, but having said that, the defense, you know, they returned guy, nine guys, but they weren't exactly lighting the world on fire last year. So, yeah, true. You, you have a mediocre defense coming back, um, bringing back a bunch of starters. You know, it could just be more of the same mediocrity. Or then again, you know, maybe they could make a couple steps forwards and turn the corner from being a mediocre defense to being a good defense. So we'll see there. And, um, Ohio State's offense, you know, was the question mark last year, of course, with uh, big question marks on the offensive line, particularly, and a little bit of wide receiver as well. You know, the uh, the, wide rec- the wide receivers just did, they didn't seem to get a lot of separation last year. You know, so we should couple that with with uh, Barrett having to run for his life, and um, you know, and that leading to some inaccuracy. The you know the passing game was was not good last year, of course. So. You know, it's it's. I hope that they've corrected that. Um, I, Kevin Wilson, I think, will go a long ways towards that because the play calling was extremely poor yeah. last year. It was extremely predictable. Yeah. And now you're bringing in, you know, going yeah. from like incompetent coordinators to really good, if not great, coordinator in Kevin Wilson. That should yeah. make a big difference. And quarterback coach. So you know, I'm, I'm I'm waiting to see. Is this is is the 2014 JT? You know, back when he got Heisman votes, um, is that an aberration, right? Because that's that's he had that great year, and then we've not seen it since. But then Tom Herman left after that year, so he's not had mm-hmm. competent coaching since mm-hmm. that year. Is that was that the aberration, mm-hmm. or is that just that's what we should expect once JT has you know solid coaching? So, I mean, uh, what is your take on that? I, dude, expect JT to be very. Um, uh, close to 2014. I really believe that. I, I think you hit the nail on the head, dude. Uh, Ed Warner's um, play calling, um, especially last season, uh, the tail end of 2015, he didn't do a bad job. I mean, when, when we just smashed Michigan and rolled over Notre Dame in the bowl game, I thought, okay. All right, the, the Ed Warner, you showed me something with the offense. I'm, that's what I'm expecting to see on a pretty consistent basis in 2016. But it just seemed like, and when the season began, I saw that. I mean, we saw a pretty productive offense. I mean, they were just obviously they lit up Bowling Green. They went down there and uh, dominated uh, an Oklahoma team on their turf. That was, you know, that ended up actually finishing ahead of them. In the AP poll at the end of the year, Oklahoma finished like in sixth uh, or fifth, I believe, or sixth, uh, fifth or seventh. They were either a spot ahead or a spot behind Ohio State in the AP poll anyways. But Ohio State worked them out. And then as the season progressed, you saw the offensive play calling get worse and predictable. And, of course, it just culminated in the disaster that was uh, the Fiesta Bowl against Clemson. I think Kevin Wilson comes in here. He gives this offense a, a, a rejuvenation, a shot in the arm um, like Tom Herman uh, did with them, and, and you saw obviously his progression um, from 2012 to 2014, and especially even throughout 2014 with JT, and we saw JT get better, and I think we can still see that kind of JT Barrett. He's got it in him. We know he does. If he can do it as a redshirt freshman, he can damn well do it as a redshirt senior. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is a fifth-year senior. He's a smart kid, good kid, uh, level-headed kid. Um, so I think that Kevin Wilson comes in and we're going to see, uh, a JT Barrett. And, and I think you're going to see like in 2014 where JT started off a little bit slow and then obviously progressed his way through. 
And I think that's what we are going to see with him this year. I think he's going to, you know, start off a little bit slow. He's got a new coordinator. They got to kind of get to know each other a little bit, feel each other out. But by midseason, um, you're going to really start seeing this offense take shape. And in fact, maybe even sooner than that. Um, I, you know, I don't want to put too much pressure on their shoulders, but you know, you got Oklahoma in your second game of the year, so hopefully they're going to have a lot of the kinks worked out by then. I'm not expecting it to be perfect by any means, but yeah, man, I'm excited. I think JT Barrett is going to do some good things this year. I got confidence that uh, Kevin Wilson is going to get him, uh, get him in the right spot. I really do. Yeah, I, I think so too. I mean, I think you know we've already seen it. You know, we saw what he can do in 2014. And the difference from 2014 to you know the last two years, primarily it was the coaching staff. Now, granted, there was also no Devin Smith either. Mm-hmm. That made a big difference as well. Yeah. But no uh, 12 gauge launching it down the field, and um, that's been a sore spot. It has been a, a spot of contention, and it's almost like it. It kind of once again like Ed Warner's you know end of the year offense culminating in a disaster. Last year, the last couple of seasons at wide receiver, you've kind of seen that culmination and that, that you, you kind of, we saw what we had last year. And I mean, Noah Brown was our best receiver. And hell, what did he end up with, like, Chris? Like, did he get more than 400 receiving yards all year? I know that sounds insane. Yeah, it was but, pathetic. I mean, it, he didn't have very many catches at all. He just disappeared. You know, he had that really great game. It was basically one good game against Oklahoma. Oklahoma. And he yeah. decided to go out on that. And, and apparently he's looked pretty good in Cowboys camp. So that leads me really? to believe that, you know, it's just Wilson wasn't, or I'm sorry, not Wilson, but Warner. I'm getting all my names mixed up today. Warner and, and uh, Tim <laughs> Beck were just not putting so, in a position to succeed. Mm-hmm. You know? yep. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's, that was the issue and not the wide receivers. I mean, if recruiting rankings mean anything, it's not the talent on the field. It's It was the coaching. So... You know, we'll see. So I, I am, um, you know, I mean, Indiana, it's, it's, a, it's an offense where it's, they're not going to just roll over. Um, their, their defense isn't one they're just going to roll over, but it's also not one that's going to really challenge them, which maybe that's probably a good thing for, you know, the, the first game of the year. Now, on yeah. the other side, one thing that Kevin Wilson did bring to Indiana was he got that offense going and looking really good and being able to just sit in the ring and trade punches with Ohio State. You know, they return a lot of experience on offense as well. They um, they have a really dangerous receiving core, you know, and they have a physical offensive line. You know, the running backs have looked really good under Kevin Wilson. You know, that's one of the things that yep. kind of has me excited is while, yep. while Indiana throws the ball, it's not like Kevin Wilson is just like basketball on grass, right? He still features a power running game. So I, I like that we're not losing that with, with Kevin Wilson coming in, right? So, you know, we got to see what the defense is going to do versus that. They, um, you know, they lost some people. I mean, one thing is that, that Indiana was not good at on offense last year was turning the ball over. They were, you know, one of the worst teams in the Big Ten at, at creating turnovers. And meanwhile, Ohio State was one of the best at generating turnovers. But on that same hand, you know, they lose Malik Hooker. You know, they, they lose Gary and Conley yeah. uh, and, and so forth. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, like how many of those turnovers were based off of Malik Cooker alone, you know? <laughs> but, yeah. but, but you know, having said that, all the guys coming in are like our ultra-athletic players to come in and, and um, replace those guys that went out. You know, it's not like the defense is, is ta- taking any kind of a step back as far as athleticism and potential. And the defensive line is just ridiculous, the, what they have coming back. So that filthy. can cover up a lot of mistakes in the secondary. Yep. Let me tell you what, dude. Uh, defensive line certainly going to be the uh, – it's the backbone and the anchor of, of this defense this year. Uh, linebackers, though, I mean, it could be pretty damn good. You're returning two starters, Chris Worley and uh, Jerome Baker, and virtually uh, what you know, a guy who should have been the uh, starter last year – but Baker came in and started for him, and that's Dante Booker because Booker, of course, got hurt first game there against Bowling Green and was out for the year. So, um, <clears throat> But the linebackers, yeah, are going to be good just that uh, you touched on it, the secondary. It's going to be interesting to see um, you know, what they're going to do here, uh, especially at the one safety spot. I mean, we know Damon Webb starting at one. Uh, you know, is it going to be – it looks like it's coming down to Eric Smith uh, or Jordan Fuller uh, at the other safety spot. 
But Kerry Combs uh, and Greg Schiano both said that the, they not only want to continue doing a three corner back rotation, they might even try and do a four corner rotation this year, Chris. How, how crazy would that be? Well, I mean, there's a couple things here. So one, you keep fresh legs in there. Yep. And other teams aren't able to rotate without there being a drop off. So if other teams like in Indiana wants to to keep fresh legs and rotate, well, the guys, the backups they're putting in just aren't as good. So you'll take that any day. Um, where, you know, if they, meanwhile, if they just leave the same guy out there, they're going to get tired. And so that's why you see a lot of times in the second half, Ohio State pulls away from these lesser teams because they're getting tired where Ohio State's rotating guys and they're not tired. They're still fresh. So that's kind of cool. Right. And the other thing is with the way Ohio State is just year after year losing guys early to the NFL from that secondary, <laughs> and that's going to yeah. happen again. They're going to lose at least Denzel Ward and yeah. maybe Kendall Sheffield. Yeah, would that not be crazy? Yeah, one, I mean, year one year comes in, done. see you. Um, Peace. Because he's one of the three, and they're, you know, they're talking about a three-man rotation. It's basically they, they just announced – well, they Ohio State didn't announce, but Damon Arnett's mom announced on Twitter <laughs> that he started <laughs> – Ah. And, uh, Damon Arnett's mom. mom right. Breaking news from Damon Arnett's mom. Right. He is announced as the starter. Right. But I mean, but we well, know that's that, great. Like, I, whenever a guy is starting his first game, the coaches call them, call up the parents, and tell them, "Hey, just want to let you know, yeah. your son's starting this Saturday." Yeah. So, yeah. So she would know. You know, she she. Uh, you would hope. Yeah, she wouldn't have done that if she didn't get the call. But <laughs> the, so you know, uh, looking at Denzel Ward, Damon Arnett, Kevin. She, um, Kevin? Kendall. Kevin Sheffield. Like Kendall. I said, today is not a good day for names for me. You're just going to have to live with it. Kendall Sheffield and Ward, both people are saying they could both go. Yeah, and yeah. So, but, but then if you're going to do that, work that fourth guy in, Jeffrey Okuda, he's the number four guy that they're talking about working in, true freshman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, then next year when you, you know, once again, half your guys leave early for the NFL, you've got guys replacing them that have some seasoning. So... I like that. I mean, if we can go with four, let's do it because, I mean, they're just going through defensive backs like it's going out of style, you know. So with uh, the receivers that Indiana uh, has coming back, especially that Simi Cobbs, Simi Cobbs Jr., he's a fourth-year junior this year. He's uh, he's not bad. Uh, and uh, who are the other guys? Like, I think they got uh, – what's the uh, – what is this? Nick Westbrook, a junior – um, you know, I, they got Richard Lego, uh, coming back and, and he did all right last year. Um, yeah, are, are these receivers going to be able to give Ohio State's defensive backs any problems in this game? I mean, let's not forget that last year, of course, this was once again a, uh, Kevin Wilson style offense, uh, last season, but yeah, Indiana's been pretty damn good the last couple of years throwing the football. In fact, this was like the second rated passing offense uh, in the Big Ten last year. So, um, you know, we saw what uh, Ohio State secondary was able to do last year, despite the fact that they had as many people leave as they did, and everybody thought, uh-oh, Ohio State's going to be in trouble. Well, all they did was uh, get, what, 21, 22 interceptions last year and, like, seven for touchdowns. I mean, seven uh, interceptions returned for touchdowns led the entire NCAA last season. So, uh, once again, like you said, Ohio State in a, in a position where they've got to now, you know, three new uh, defensive backs that are in there, and, and heck, maybe four or five new defensive backs, depending on uh, how many they have uh, coming in and rotating at corner. Um, but is this a uh, is, does this concern you? Against uh, an Indiana team that last couple of years can uh, has shown they can throw the football. You know, I, I mean, Indiana's going to score. You know, I mean, unless they like really have a tremendous drop off because Wilson's gone. You know, and now it's like, oh, geez, you know, he was the mastermind holding it all together. I, but I, you know, Indiana's going to get some scores. But I, I'm not really that concerned about the defense. I think the defense is going to be just fine. Greg Shiano has been amazing. Kerry Combs, yeah. all the all the assistants, getting those players ready, and like I said, the the def, the defensive line, the defensive ends in particular, are just ridiculous. I mean, they've got their backups. Pro, I mean, probably their third string is where you're looking at like NFL players here, right? But their their backups are for sure NFL players. So right now, the second string defensive ends is Nick Bosa and Jalen Holmes. I mean, it's they're they're saying <laughs> Jalen Holmes is going to be drafted like 
if he were to come out like right now, he would probably be a third round draft pick. Nick Bosa is probably going to be a first round draft pick. And that's our second string. You know, starting, you got to, yeah. Taekwon Lewis, who was, you know, only the defensive lineman of the year in the Big Ten last year. And that's Sam right. Hubbard, you know? Yeah. So the defensive ends are ridiculous. That's not even talking about the third string, which is two five star guys that are just trying to get on the field and Jonathan Cooper and the star of the class of 2017, Chase Young, who just everyone yeah. says just, uh, looks amazing a beast yeah, yeah. Just, a, just, a, just a beast he might be you know the best defensive on on the team um he's just raw so and you know that's going to cover up a lot of flaws that we could see in the secondary you know that that's going to make things a lot easier on those guys and you know they like when they go into passing downs they go into that rushman package where you get four, you know four defensive ends out there so we're going to see all those guys in the field at the same time at, at, at points and I expect it to be, you know, tough for opposing teams. You know, it's the only way teams were able to survive last year is they had to go short. You know, they nobody yeah. you, you saw nobody really try to throw downfield on Ohio State. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they couldn't protect the quarterback that long. I think that that is a uh, that's that's a fair point. And Nick Bosa said that he feels this season um, going to be a lot different for. Uh, the, the defensive line, apparently they're working on some things to really, um, get, you, you know, get the most out of the defensive line, get them really rushing the quarterback. Not that they didn't do a good job of it last year, but, uh, both I guess, made a comment like, oh, yeah, it was frustrating last year because we did a lot of things that, um, were for the linebackers. Like they basically set up defenses to, to let the linebackers make plays. And he said this year that it's going to be more the defensive, uh, line getting after it. And I thought, well, I, I, I don't know. I didn't see that as being the case because, uh, they, I, I thought the defensive line played great last year. I mean, just like you said, I mean, Tyquan Lewis, he was the defensive lineman uh, of the year in the Big Ten last year. I thought he played great. I mean, Sam Hubbard's just an absolute beast. And I thought Nick Bosa played pretty damn well, too. So uh, I think this season, yeah, with as many defensive linemen, I mean, they are, they're talking about Chase Young, true freshman uh, from uh, Maryland, uh, who was one of, if not what, the top defensive uh, ends in the country yeah. uh, this past season. I think he was number four player overall in the country, regardless of position. <laughs> number four player overall. I mean, that's just insane, dude. The, this, the, the defensive line this season, I have absolutely um, every confidence in the world that they can play. I, I mean, seriously, Chris, they could play eight to ten guys, at least eight guys, easily, easily. Like you said, Jalen Holmes and Nick Bosa, they're playing. They're getting into the game, and they're going to get significant playing time, and they're the damn backups. So expect other guys uh, like Robert P.B. Landers to be getting in. He's going to be getting a lot of time on the field. I think Jonathan Cooper, uh, Malik Barrow might even see some time. Who knows? We'll have to see if uh, Tracy Sprinkle. Well, hell, he's a captain, so we know he's going to play. Yeah, um, I mean, and he was pretty good before he got injured last year. He was a starter. So we're, yeah. we're gaining a starter, although we do lose a starter in Michael Hill for um, at least a few games as we're, you know, he was suspended by the NCAA for six games. And I think Ohio state's appealing to try to get that lower. Yes. So we'll see, but yes. it, it, at a minimum, so I, think, I think, you know, we're not going to see him for Oklahoma at a minimum. Yeah. I but, think, uh, but, but everybody else is back though. So you're trading, but, yeah. you're basically you're trading Michael Hill for Tracy Sprinkle. Yeah. So that's, you know, that yeah. should be a wash, hopefully assuming yeah. Tracy Sprinkle is fully recovered. Yeah, I mean, Draymond Jones, obviously, he started then for Tracy Sprinkle, uh, Tracy Sprinkle last year, and, uh, just, I thought did an, did an excellent job oh, yeah. as a redshirt freshman. So, uh, you know, he's back starting. I mean, expect it. Yeah, this defensive line, I think, Chris, they're, they're, they're gonna be filthy. Uh, and I think, to your point, they're gonna help mask up maybe, maybe some, uh, of the flaws that the defensive backs may be committing throughout the game just because they're putting so much damn pressure on the quarterback, he doesn't have time to shit or wind his watch. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So what do you think then? Um, once again, playing in Bloomington, it's tough. We're over there. I, I, I think I just I think Ohio State is too talented. Um, I think with this Indiana team losing Kevin Wilson, and who knows, that might have been actually a uh, – 
positive thing for them because apparently Kevin Wilson was kind of a jerk, you know, by all uh, uh, reports, at least the way that he handled certain things over there at Indiana, uh, you know, kind of kind of calling some, some dudes uh, some names that, you know, were not very nice. Now, of course, when you're a coach and you're coaching football, you're not supposed to be all nice. I mean, you are supposed to get in dudes' faces a little bit and shake some things up, right? Uh, but apparently he was a little harsh at times. Now he's here with the Buckeyes. Is that kind of attitude uh, going to be good for Ohio State, going to be bad? Uh, is it good for Indiana? Is it bad? I, I just think overall them losing Kevin Wilson and the um, offensive mindset that he brought to that team. Um, I think Ohio State goes over there and, and takes care of business. And, um, you know, I think uh, – I, 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 I don't think it's going to get ugly, but I think that Ohio State wins comfortably eh, by about 17. You know, two touchdowns, 17 points. I'm going to put it at that. Well, let's see. The line is 20 and a half, so mm. basically three touchdowns. Yeah. And uh, the over-under is 56 and a half. So, you know, I kind of like the the Wilson revenge factor because I'm of the opinion he kind of got screwed at Indiana he, really? Well, I mean, he wasn't fired. So if they didn't have any dirt on him, you know, and in fact, ESPN did that. They they went to Indiana to do like an expose. They were like intentionally trying to dig up dirt on Kevin Wilson and came away with nothing. Oh, yeah. And they ended it, up having, I, I, I didn't see the, the, the special, but I ended up like, um, they, they ended up like making the story about, like the men's tennis team or something like that. It was like the lacrosse team or something, you know, they just, because there was nothing to find about They're like, Oh, well this sucks. We, we, you know, we thought we'd have a nice juicy story. And as it, you know, what, what it was is Kevin Wilson and the powers that be, I don't know if that's like the athletic director or the president, or maybe somebody on the board of governors, he rubbed them the wrong way. And so they wanted him out and they tried to make it sound like, Oh, he was mistreating the players, but then you talk to the players and all these players came forward to defend him. And there was one or two players came forward and said that didn't defend him. And they were like, Kevin, but this was their complaint, right? It's not that he was being abusive, which is what like the rumors that were being leaked. It was, well, he was a hard ass. It's like, gee, football coach is a hard ass. Mm, boy. Yeah. Like I said, you're yeah, ne- football, never heard of that one before. To. Wow. This is uh, right. he's breaking all the stereotypes, you know, <laughs> just on a whole different subject that just, irritates me when i mean it's almost seriously the wussification of america chris i mean come on dude it's football you're you're hitting each other you are flying bodies into one another smacking each other you can't sit there and hold their hand and and talk quietly to them and stroke their their ego you know you got to be a little bit abrasive this is a a contact sport it's a mean sport it's a violent sport you know you got to get these kids ready to, to, to be violent and, and crush each other. That's what you need to do if you can't get it through not being a little tough sometimes. You know what I'm saying? It's the wussification of America, Chris. I'm tired of it. Yeah, man. I mean, if you've never had a coach's spittle flying in your face as he's reaming you a new one, right. then uh, you've not been you coached very well. Your, you know I mean? Your face just, yeah, just, you know, covered in saliva, just dripping down. You know, that's that's the only way to be taught. Uh, how to play a sport as a coach up in your face, spittle flying everywhere, man. God. So then, yeah, uh, what do you, when you say Kevin Wilson revenge factor, then do you think it's Kevin Wilson getting revenge on them or them getting revenge on Kevin Wilson for leaving? Oh, no. I mean, I think, you know, he's going to be going for blood. There's going to be no calling off the dogs until they're buried. You know, if he can, he's going to bury them. Uh, we know he's going to come out with a tempo offense that he's going to do anyway, whether it was Indiana or not. He's supposed to go out there and, um, you know, he wants to run the other team off the field. And he was pretty gar- darn good at that at Indiana. I think he was saying he wants to see 90 mm-hmm. offensive plays a game, something like that. So that's that's a lot. And he's going to come out there and he and he's going to he's not going to leave anything on the table. I don't think there's going to be any of this. Let's hold something back for Oklahoma kind of stuff. Because he's he is gonna want to show Indiana exactly what they are missing, so you know I I think it's gonna get ugly. I think that that uh fifty six and a half over under. I mean take the over because that might just be Ohio State score alone. I'm gonna say I'm you know I'm gonna give them that. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say fifty six Ohio State and uh, twenty four 
Indiana. Hmm. 56, Ohio State, 24, Indiana. So that is a 32-point win. You got to beat in the spread and obviously covering the over-under. Yeah, 56 points, dude. Yeah, the 56-5 over-under, just like, that's easy money right there. Take the over on that. Okay, so, all right. I said by 14 or 17 points, I didn't give it an actual score. I do think that Ohio State can put some points on the board. However, I don't think that they go as much as, as, as what you're saying. I still think, I mean, this is a Big Ten team that did all right last year. They do have some guys coming back. Granted, their defense was, has never been their strong suit. At least it hasn't been the last couple of years. So I'm going to say Ohio State can put at least – Oh, I'm going to go with uh, 38 to 38 to 24. So I'm going to just, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put us over. I'm going to give a, a, or both teams, you know, I'm going to put them over the 56 and a half and then uh, uh, do not have them beating the spread at this point, though. I got 38 to 38 to 24, 14 point win, and you're saying 56 to 24. Yep, I'm, so I'm putting a lot of weight on. Kevin Wilson having some spittle flying. <laughs> so that's where my my bet my money is at. So. Bet on Kevin Wilson's spittle, if anything. You think you could put that bet down in Vegas? <laughs> you can bet I'd on like damn to put a uh, hundred so. bucks on Kevin Wilson's spit. I have right. a feeling his spittle is going to be all over the field. Can I bet on that, please? Spittle in the face. Oh man! Well, uh, so there you go. That is our Indiana uh, Indiana uh, outlook, and I uh, can't believe it, Chris. We're finally here, and, and coming up in yeah, five days. Five days, not not like six days, or well, actually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I guess four days, right? Four days. Or are we going to count today as a day? Well, Monday would be one, right. Tuesday two, Wednesday three, three Thursday, Thursday four. four. Wow. So we're looking at four days and a couple hours, basically. Mm, yep. It's currently, we're recording this right now, Eastern Daylight Time. It's uh, 20 till 2 in the afternoon. By the time it comes out, uh, we get this posted. It'll be a little bit later than that. So, uh, yeah, 8 o'clock night game in Bloomington. Uh, this this should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Hey, before we close this thing out, yeah. I wanted to, to continue on the air a conversation we had in um, offline Ohio State recently released the times. They did, they did some 40-yard dash times for the team. Ah, and yes. they released the top 11 players on the team. Yes. And these times, I have to wonder, they said they were electronically timed. But I'm like, is it a fast track, whatever? But they had a number of guys that were under 4-4. So, you know, I have a hard time believing that if they ran at the NFL Combine – that you're going to see those same kind of numbers because if you look at out of all the, the colleges sending their best players there, the number of guys who actually run under a four four is very very small. Um, you know, I think you could count them on one hand typically. So that they had that many, just Ohio State has that many right now, um, has been questioned the overall time. But the fact that they put them in order makes it so that I'm like, hmm. Maybe, um, you know, we can look at who's the fastest, who's the second fastest, that sort of thing, right? So, you know, as a surprise to no one, Denzel Ward was the fastest player on the team, checking at a blistering 4-2-3. Um, you know, I'll believe that when I see it. But they, <laughs> they actually had number two, four two five was Kendall Sheffield. And number three, Paris Campbell, four two six. So they had three guys under 4-3. That's, that's just not legit. There's, there's no way. Um, you don't I mean, think? Most NFL think they're drafts, a little uh, one, inflated? Yeah, I mean, most NFL drafts, I don't even think have a single guy under 4-3. Occasionally you get one or two, but to, for Ohio State to have three. Here's the interesting thing, though. Four, J.K. Dobbins, 4-3-2. Five, Mike Weber, 4-3-5. Mike Weber, fifth on the team. Now, he did not look like the fifth fastest player on the team last year. I uh, Yeah, I'm not buying that either, dude. I'm not buying that. I'm sorry. Well, so here's the, what I'm going to remember last year. Well, his freshman year, he was injured, which is why he redshirted. They said he was set to play his freshman year, but he was injured. So I'm wondering if he still had, it was a, it was like a hamstring, I think. I'm wondering if he still had a lingering hamstring, maybe. I don't know. Um, but to run a four, three, five. So yeah, I, I, I'm sure he doesn't, he didn't run a four, three, five, but to be the fifth fastest player. So he's faster than like number seven on the list is Elijah go, or sorry, Elijah goings. Le Elijah goings is number six, a walk on, um, we're That's probably crazy. gonna see him in mop up duty, but yeah. number seven is Terry McLaurin. Now Terry McLaurin, 
he went to when the opening in Oregon, that's like the biggest camp for, you know, it's just the, the cream of the crop, the best players in the country in high school go to this one. There's several openings around the country, but the one in Oregon is where like they take the stars of each, you know, it's like an all-star team, right? They take, they pick the stars from each opening in the regional areas and send them to Oregon for like a, a granddaddy one. And they do the testing there kind of like a, you know, a combine, right? And then they take the numbers from the testing and they, they put out what's called a spark champion S P A R Q. I have no idea what the acronym is for, but I know it's about testing athleticism. Okay. And you're legit. If you're, you know, even just in like the top five, cause you're playing against like the top players in the country. Right. So if you're in the top five of the spark at uh, Oregon's the opening, you're really athletic. Or if you're like number one in your position group, cause you know, an offensive lineman is never going to rank out at like number one in the spark overall. But if you're number one at your position group for offensive line, you're pretty athletic, that sort of thing. Right. Terry McLaurin was number one overall. This kid is no joke. As far as his athleticism goes, you know, Mike Weber ran faster than him. So I'm like, if Mike Weber is really faster than Terry McLaurin, I mean, maybe Terry McLaurin isn't as fast as he was before, but, but at the same time, Terry McLaurin still was seventh fastest on the team. He, he ran a four, three, six. You know, it's not like he ran a slow time, you know? Right. Um, I mean, but regardless, uh, you know, he, he, if, if Mike Weber is truly the fifth fastest player on this team, then we need to watch out for Mike Weber because I mean, that was one of the things about him last year is you never saw him outrun anybody, you know? Um, you never saw him break, you never saw him outrun anybody. You never saw him break a tackle. It's like, for me, you gotta be at least one or the other. I mean, the thing that was special about Zeke is he could do both. He could break a tackle and he could outrun you. He was, he had the blazing fast speed uh-huh. and the size, you know, but you, if you, you need to have one of those, you know, that's, that was like the, the problem with, um, with Dontre, you know, back there, they put Dontre in the backfield and well, I mean, I guess he was fast. He did have the speed, but you'd, you'd get a hand on him and he'd be down. Right. Um, Mike Weber, you never really saw him breaking tackles, trucking anybody. And you never, when he get, when he would get, you know, past the, the line of scrimmage or whatever, it's like, they'd always catch him. You know, he could never break the angle and, and go down the field. Well, if he's the fifth fastest player on the team, he's going to, he's got breakaway speed. Then that's, that puts him, you know, maybe not Ezekiel Elliott speed, but, um, plenty good enough. You know what I mean? I mean, that's plenty good enough. When you're running back to the fifth fastest player on your team and you're a team that's as fast and athletic as Ohio state, that's plenty good enough. And, and oh, by the way, J.K. Dobbins is four, who's also fourth fastest player on the team. There's some serious speed coming out of the running back spot if these numbers are to be believed. And the Mike Weber one is, frankly, is shocking based on, you know, he did not pass that. <sighs> the, the eyeball test did not say this guy's the fa- fifth fastest player on the team last year. So. I, I agree. I agree. So, um, w- either, either this time was an aberration or he was injured last year or maybe Mickey Marotti is working some miracles on speed as well. I mean, the, the players do get faster w- when they go to Ohio state, they, the biggest gains you see is in their body transformation and their, yeah. you know, their, um, Mickey Marotti adds muscle and drops body fat and they come out of there looking chiseled, you know, that's the biggest transformation you see, but you do see some gains in speed a lot of times, you know, cause they're always testing and uh, they, they do help the players to increase, increase their speed a little bit, but it's usually not a lot, you know, usually coming out of high school, if you're really fast, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to tweak that too much. Maybe with Mike Weber, they did a little more than just like a little tweak, you know? Don't get me wrong. Speed can be uh, improved upon, you know, a little bit, like you said, tweaked, if you will. But speed is that one attribute that generally right. yep. <laughs> you either got it or you don't. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you can get stronger. You can lift weights. You know, you can become more powerful, better blocker, hand techniques, feet, all that kind of stuff. But generally, speed, you either got it or you don't. I'm with you, man, if that's what they say. If that's what they're reporting, that Mike Weber ran that time, uh, okay. But, <laughs> yeah, last year, I didn't see that. I didn't see that blazing speed. So, But like you said, maybe um, he was still kind of working out the, the knee issues or whatever. So, Right. Well, he was faster than Elijah Goings, who's a walk-on wide receiver. But in, every time they release these tests, Elijah Goings is near the top. So I know we've not really seen him, but... Uh, Terry McLaurin, wide receiver, Johnny Dixon, another wide receiver, and Damon Webb, 
safety. Well, yeah. I mean, in fact, we know he's faster than a whole bunch of these like secondary wide receivers and, and you know and defensive backs because he's freaking number five overall. They only give us the top eleven, but you know, so I'm just looking at who else was up there. <laughs> but he, you know, the only players he wasn't faster than was Denzel Ward, Kendall Sheffield, Paris Campbell, and J.K. Dobbins. So everybody else he was faster than. So. If that's true, man, I'm I'm kind of excited to see what's going to happen when they give him the ball. You know, after last season, and yes, I know he was only the third uh, freshman ever to run for over a thousand yards in a season, and and that's saying something at Ohio State. Don't seriously, I mean, that's saying something because if not, um, you know, he's got yeah, J.K. Dobbins right behind him, uh, who you know a lot of people said uh, was what one of the top five running backs in the country was like the best running back in the state of Texas last year. Uh, only a true freshman, but here's a kid that I mean they are talking up right now, dude, and they're saying this guy is legit. He's smart. He's got the the the, the work ethic and the talent, and the I mean they are really praising and putting jk dobbins up on a pedestal and if mike weber's not careful dude <laughs> you know it sounds like dobbins could easily step into his spot and do just as well yeah and we're talking about a guy in mike weber who only ran for 1096 yards as a true freshman right just a six yard average per carry you know only that. right so i mean it's like he we were not impressed with him but it's it's kind of unfair. I mean, he put up pretty good numbers. I know. Was, you know, a lot of it is he just he followed the man. You know, he he had that's the problem. I think. Yep. And Zeke Elliott is looking like the best running back on the planet right now, and Mike Weber is not. And so, by comparison, you know, like oh, this guy's just not as good, and he's not. You know, but that doesn't mean he's trash. Uh, six yards per carry, you know, thousand yards as a freshman is uh, not too shabby. So. If he really has added some speed in addition, like breakaway speed to what we, you know, when he was already getting six yards of carry and that was with a incompetent offensive coordinators, what's this kid going to be able to do with <laughs> Wilson and the freaking sub four, four 40 time, you know? So I'm excited to see it. Damn. There we have it. First episode of the new Buckeye Leaf cast in the books, 2017 season. We are now officially underway, sir. And uh, as always, I want to thank you for coming along for the ride, taking time out of your busy schedule to hang out and talk a little bit of football. And uh, before we get out of here, though, uh, anything you want to shout at the listeners, some stuff maybe you uh, like to do on your own time and your own dime? Yeah, sure. So I have another podcast, the Choice Conversations podcast. So you just go to choiceconversations.com. And that's where I talk about personal development. So just how to improve all areas of your life, you know, your Get, find your purpose, find your happiness, improve your relationships, all that good stuff. So come check it out, choiceconversations.com. Rock and roll. So this episode of the show also brought to you by Christie's Cleaning Services, LLC. It's not clean until it's Christy clean. Visit her Facebook page at Christie's Cleaning Services, LLC. And, of course, brought to you by Choice Conversations with Mr. Chris Stefanik. Hit him up at Choice Convo on Twitter. And uh, it's also brought to you by Columbus Wired for your fill of Central Ohio sports and beyond. Visit ColumbusWired.net for your source for premium, premier, groundbreaking, authoritative looks at what's going on in the sports world. We're also going to uh, start uh, putting this up on a, a dedicated YouTube channel, if I'm not uh, mistaken, correct, Chris? Yep. The Buckeye Leaf Cast. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. So this was something that uh, y- you started doing, and then you said, uh, yeah, dude, we've got ourselves a YouTube channel, duh. And I'm like, well, when do we start doing that? Like, I had no freaking clue that you were putting it up on YouTube. So uh, <laughs> check out the uh, the dedicated Buckeye Leaf Cast channel on YouTube. That uh, should be pretty cool stuff. So um, until then, Chris, Thursday night, I'm psyched up, baby. Let's get it on. Let's do it. Let's leave them like we always do, sir. L-H. I-O. Go, boy!